Good morning, this is Dr. Mayer. We are now into chapter six, the audit planning phase of the audit. In this chapter, we're going to focus on specific steps that an auditor needs to go through. And these steps are going to be different depending upon whether this is a new client or a continuing client. Let's first talk about what happens if we are obtaining a new client. Obviously, we're going to submit a proposal in terms of identifying what we're going to be doing in the audit. But before we engage with this client, there's specific steps that we need to do. Specifically, we need to communicate with the predecessor auditor. The client needs to give permission to allow us to talk to the predecessor auditor. If the client refuses to do this, this does not absolutely preclude us from taking the audit. However, this should be a cautionary event that we consider as to whether or not we would accept this client. So what are we going to talk about with the predecessor auditor? What we're interested in is finding out the integrity of management, any potential disagreements that the predecessor auditor had in terms of accounting principles, any communication that the auditor has had in regards to governance, internal control, or significant deficiency issues, and understanding of the reason for the change in auditors. The overall communication that we're going to have with the predecessor auditor is we need to identify if this potential client is ethical. Because if they're not ethical, they are not a client that we want to have. Once we have established that this is a client that we want to do business with, we need to establish the relationship through what we call an engagement letter. This is a very standard form, and you will see one in the book. It identifies the entity, identifies management's responsibility. As we've talked about before, management is responsible for the financial statements. Management is responsible for providing effective internal controls. Management is responsible for providing everything that the auditor is asking for. And at the end of the audit, the management will provide a written representation regarding their responsibility and belief related to the financial statements. Our responsibility as an auditor is established in this document. And what it identifies is that we are conducting this audit in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards, whether it be PCAOB or ASB. It establishes timelines, it establishes the price, and this document is going to be signed by the client and by the auditor. Once we have established the client, the complete audit process is what you see here. We plan the audit, we obtain an understanding of the client and its environment in our assessment of material risk. We design procedures based upon this assessment, perform further audit procedures, complete the audit, form an opinion, and issue the audit report. This is the complete process, and we'll talk about this complete process throughout these lectures, but this chapter is primarily focusing on the first three elements which is planning the audit, understanding the client, and assessing the risk of material misstatement. So now let's talk about the audit planning process. We want to develop an overall audit strategy and an audit plan. Well, what does that mean? Well, potentially we're going to be using some of the client staff. We may be using the internal audit department of the client to perform some of our testing. We may involve other CPAs in the process, depending upon location and other limitations. There is a possibility that we will arrange for specialists. Specialists are involved in unique aspects related to the audit, perhaps valuation, assessment of certain elements of the financial statement, maybe investment or the pension plan. And then if we are conducting the audit for the first time, one of the things that we need to do is to communicate again with the predecessor auditor primarily to identify elements that we need to begin the audit. Some of these things may be the timeline related to depreciation for long-term assets. It may be related to the beginning balances of inventory and other items. We need to be able to understand these and understand how the pre uh, predecessor auditor identified these elements so that we can complete the audit 
for this year. We talked about obtaining an understanding of the client and its environment is part of our risk assessment procedure where we are assessing the control risk and the inherent risk. The specific procedures that we're going to do primarily include inquiries, in other words, asking lots of questions, as well as observation, inspecting documents, inspecting activities. Analytical procedures, as we've talked about before, becomes a prominent element and a critical element of our assessment of risk. Other procedures that we may consider include evaluation experts, valuation experts, legal counsel, and other information that provides a basis for us to understand the risk associated to the organization as it applies to our audit. As part of our risk assessment, we need to understand the environment where the organization works. We need to understand the competitive environment. We need to understand the supply chain as well as customer relationships. We need to understand how the organization fits into technology and technological developments. Are they ahead of the curve? Are they behind the curve? What are major laws and regulations that are going to affect the organization as well as economic conditions? And certainly as we're enduring the pandemic of COVID-19 and the implication of these issues to the health and well-being of the organization are things that we need to consider in the course of the audit. And our risk assessment, these elements are going to drive some of the testing that we are conducting. In the audit we are conducting, we are assessing the financial statements to determine if the financial statements are free of material misstatement. When we express our opinion of the financial statements, we state, in an unqualified opinion that the financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the organization. So let's talk just a minute about materiality. Materiality is clearly an important part of the audit and it occurs when the misstatement by the company is large enough such that the misstatement will reasonably have an influence on the economic decisions of the user of the financial statement. The materiality for a small company is clearly going to be much smaller than a large company. I will provide a separate video related to the measurement of materiality in the planning phase of the audit. This is an important step as we plan the audit. Our assessment of material misstatement is going to be based on the materiality measurements that we establish in the planning phase of the audit. In the planning phase of the audit, we're asking ourselves what could go wrong and what additional steps do we need to implement within the audit to mitigate the risk that we've identified in the planning phase. When performing the risk assessment, the auditor should be alert for significant risks that require special audit attention. For these risks, the auditor should carefully consider internal controls, not relying on testing that we did in the prior period, as well as not relying on analytical procedures to obtain evidence about these related financial statement assertions. We need to think critically as we are conducting the planning phase. Some of the elements that we need to think outside the box relate to fraud risk. Generally speaking, when we think about fraud risks, there are two types of fraud risks. One is management fraud related specifically to fraudulent reporting of the financial statements. This is generally a fraud that you see in the executive suite of the organization. And then we have misappropriation of assets, primarily what we call an occupational fraud. This is basically stealing assets from the organization. Anyone could be involved with this. We need to develop specific audit procedures to identify incentives, opportunities, as well as attitudes that management and others within the organization may have to rationalize the fraud that they're perpetrating. As we respond to fraud risk, we need to adjust our professional skepticism and our audit evidence to make sure that we're identifying potential fraud. Auditors generally use 
a strategy in terms of identifying potential fraud. I always tell my students that as an auditor, we need to think like a fraudster. In many cases, the auditors will get together once they've completed their assessment of internal controls and brainstorm thinking about ways a perpetrator of fraud could get away with their fraud. Based upon this discussion, the auditors will develop specific audit procedures to identify these potential fraud risks. Once we've identified these preliminary audit steps within the audit, we will then go on and identify specific additional tests related to internal controls and substantive testing. That is the focus of our upcoming chapters, and I look forward to our discussion. Mm -hmm.